Welcome to Winterset in Summer 2020, an online conversation to connect writers with readers like you. We're deeply grateful to our sponsors and donors, without whose support we could not bring you our festival. We can't be together at the beaches on the beautiful Eastport Peninsula this year, but we hope to welcome you in person in August 2021 for our 20th annual festival. Until then, sit back and enjoy the show wherever you happen to be. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Winter Set in Summer Literary Festival, digital edition, uh, because, of course, we've got that bloody pandemic cursing all of us. And uh, we've been experimenting this year because it's been important to bring Winter Set in some modest form, but certainly the talent on our program to everybody who's plugged in. So I hope we have a big audience for today, especially because we have a wonderful writer here. I hesitate to say new writer because Eva Crocker is, um, as somebody said, she's already emerged. She's there, um, but we'll be talking to her in a second and she's going to do a reading first. Uh, I guess I should tell everybody I'm Noreen Golfman. I'm a member of the board and part of um, this year's program as host. And uh, it's been a really interesting exercise in social distancing, um, but we're proud and happy to be showing at least a sample of what Winter Set is all about. Typically we'd be at the beaches in beautiful Eastport. And so let's hope we get back there next year. So thanks everybody for tuning in. And I know you're in for a treat. And I should just say that uh, after the conversation that we're recording here today, uh, we'll be streaming all of this live during the festival weekend. Of course, that's what you're watching right now. And uh, we'll entertain questions from people who are watching and listening for the time we have left in our schedule. So thanks again. So a few words, um, they're easy to find for Eva Crocker, who is a great talent, uh, born and raised in St. John's, and uh, she is um, really quite a talent. Uh, the book that she's going to read from, All I Ask, uh, has gotten a lot of attention. I feel like it's still very, very fresh in the uh, imagination of readers, certainly in this country and uh, possibly beyond. And um, it's been recommended, say, by the Globe and Mail as one of the hot books to be reading this season. So I imagine that got a lot of attention. And it falls on the heels of her extremely successful collection of short stories, Barreling Forward. Um, and uh, it, too, if you know anything about Eva Crocker's work, has garnered a lot of attention, prizes, nominations. Uh, really very, very refreshing, um, brilliant take on what it's like to be living in this godforsaken town in the uh, 2020s or 2010s. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Eva and she's going to read for, uh, for a bit and then we'll have a chat. For that, Noreen. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to Winterset for having me. I'm really excited to be a part of the festival. Um, so I'm going to read a short bit from my new book, All I Ask. Um, I began working on this in 2017 after a group of policemen came to my home in St. John's and told me I was under arrest for transmitting child pornography. Um, and, you know, I was home alone this group of men with guns came in and gave me this information. Later, they admitted that that was a mistake. Um, they were investigating someone I didn't know who had lived in my home months before I moved in. Um, but it was a really terrifying event. And in the aftermath of it, I thought a lot about how much worse that could have been for me had I not been a white cisgender woman, if English weren't my first language, if I had had children there with me. Um, and it was at a moment when there was a conversation happening in the province 
about police violence and corruption in the police and a general distrust of the police. And this conversation was playing out between individuals, but also in the media and it was centered around the over policing um, and violent arrest of land protectors at the Muskrat Falls site of uh, the acquittal of rapist Doug Snellgrove, the murder by police of Don Dumphy. And so I, a little bit, this book is about that moment. Um, so I think it's also important to mention that at this moment, there's a really important conversation happening in our province about violence against racialized people specifically being enacted by the police. We saw a Black Lives Matter chapter form here in Newfoundland and Labrador in the past couple months and hold their first demonstration and also a um, call to action led by indigenous activists in the province talking about the ongoing and historical violence towards racialized people in our province. Um, so I'm gonna read a short section from the beginning of the book, which is about that moment when the police arrived. And I know that may be disturbing for some people and possibly triggering. So it's just about three minutes. And if you wanna skim over that, you're totally welcome to. Uh, so this is from the very opening. They took my computer and phone so they could copy the contents. They called it a mirror image. They said it was the fastest way to prove I wasn't the suspect and also I didn't have a choice. There were nudes. There was a picture taken with the flash of a pimple on the back of my neck, swollen and inflamed. They didn't know when they'd get to it. The unit was really backed up. What was it called? Child pornography, digital something? the unit. He said there were only three or four guys in the unit for the whole province. There were rejection emails from casting directors, all the stupid things I'd Googled, things I should have known. When did Newfoundland join Canada? What is Brexit? Are most oven dials Fahrenheit or Celsius? How much of that is in the mirror image? Reams of it. These things take time. Couldn't tell you. A judge in Gander signed the warrant. What were they looking for? Illegal digital material. What does that mean? And what does transmitted mean? Transmitted from my address. Is it the same as seeded? It's different than uploaded. I've seen uploaded in the paper. Footage of some slumped shouldered man in a windbreaker pulled over his head walking into the courtroom. A drawing in the newspaper of some sad sack evil piece of shit sitting beside the judge. Who was combing through my hard drive, picking through the digital traces, footsteps, shadows, taking in all the undeleted drafts, all the weird unflattering angles, three or four guys taking their time. And then I'm gonna skip ahead a little because this is also a love story. Um, and the protagonist, Stacy, is in having her first kind of serious queer relationship but this section is a little before that. Um, this is a different relationship and this scene is taking place at a New Year's Eve party. When we got outside, people were lighting Roman candles plunged in the snow. They'd bend over to light the cardboard tubes with a barbecue lighter and jog away. We joined a loose circle of people passing a joint around. The Roman candles made a hissing noise before spraying sparks and curls of smoke. Bright orange embers hopped on the snow. When the joint got to me, I inhaled deeply and held the smoke in until it made my chest hot. I exhaled through my nose and got the spins. I think Greg Lockyer wants to come home with us, I whispered into Nicola's hair. I thought I said it quietly, but I'm a bad whisperer, so who knows? Why? He told me he did. He said he wants that, I said. I handed Nicola the joint. What do you think of that, I asked. It's fine, she said, but she passed the joint on and stomped off into the yard. When I turned around, Nicola was swishing a room, Roman candle through the air. Her arm arced upwards, shooting flares of light over the fence, then down at the ground. The sparks burrowed into the snow, leaving black craters when they fizzled out. People yelled, a combination of warnings and cheering. Nicola spun around and waved her arm back and forth across her chest. A rush of sparks hit the house some ricocheted up the barbecue back towards our semicircle. I didn't feel anything, but I slapped my palm against my face. I smelled burnt hair. Somehow I knew the smell right away. 
She dropped the cardboard tube and it spun itself in a lazy circle in the snow, sputtering out the last of its smoky guts. I combed my fingers through my bangs and singed bits of hair fluttered past my eyes. There was a wet spot on my forehead. I poked it and it stung. Am I bleeding? I asked the guy next to me. He got his phone out of his pocket and shone a light in my face. A little bit, yeah. Nicola came up to the bathroom with me. We both leaned into the medicine cabinet mirror. There was a raw pink circle the size of a quarter on my forehead. There were pinpricks of blood inside it that reminded me of the craters on the moon. I really didn't try to do that. I promise, I swear, I never, I just wouldn't, Nicola said. I think my bangs actually look kind of cool, I told her. Later, Nicola, Greg Lockyer, and I ran through streets that were greasy with slush back to my house. We passed a group of guys with their shirts undone who yelled Happy New Year to us. When we got to the house, we were laughing hysterically about how Nicola had wiped out and landed on her ass. I kept trying to shush Nicola and Greg because Viv and Mike were sleeping across the hall from my room but then I'd succumb to a fit of giggles myself and we'd all be laughing loud together again. In my bedroom, the see-through pink handle of the tequila water gun poked out of Greg Lockyer's jeans pocket. We were all in the bed kissing, still mostly clothed. I took the gun and pointed at both of them, waving it back and forth. They opened their mouths. I pulled the sticky trigger, two squirts each, but the gun was almost empty and the alcohol didn't make it to them. Drips of tequila sank into my comforter. Nicola held up a hand for stop. Don't you have any music, Stacy? I shuffled on my knees to my desk and flipped open my laptop. I put on some sleazy 70s music. What a lady, what a night. I found us a string of condoms in the bottom drawer of my desk. In the morning, I woke up to Greg Lockyer climbing over me to get out of bed. He mouthed sorry when he saw my eyes were open. The bed springs crunched as he moved and he cringed. The room smelled of alcohol and sweat. He dressed quickly with his back to me. His freckled back and bare ass, the patch of long black hairs on the back of each thigh. I closed my eyes and listened to the familiar series of creaks and sighs the floorboards made when someone walked through the house. My mouth tasted of tequila. My teeth were scuzzy. I heard him jog lightly down the stairs, a pause as he got on his shoes and then the front door opening and closing. Nicola slept for most of the morning. I showered and lay on the couch in my bathrobe until she woke up. She came downstairs in her baggy sweater and short skirt. She'd left her tights upstairs. I sat up and she joined me on the couch. I pulled Viv's flannel blanket over her bare legs. I'm so sick, she said, me too. I slid a hand under her sweater and rubbed her bare back. It's a new year, she said, looking out the window at the gray sky. Did you have fun last night, I asked. Yeah, she said. Yeah, I asked. It was fine. I would have rather just us. She went to the bathroom and I heard her vomiting through the closed door. There were long pauses between the retching. It sounded like someone trying to lift a heavy piece of furniture. I worried again she would wake Viv and Mike. When she came out, her face was so pale, the dark bags under her eyes were frightening. I need to go home, she said. Do you want some water? I didn't want her to leave. No, could I borrow some pants? I hugged her goodbye at the door and watched her walk through a snowdrift in my jeans. Thanks. That was great. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, that voice, Stacy's voice in the novel. I just loved it. So congratulations. It was just such a great, great read. I just, uh, I felt like an, um, you know, aged observer on the town scene. Uh, all of it uh, amazingly immediate and fresh and real. And uh, I, I think, you know, the trauma of the opening is so intense and a spectacular way to open a novel. I didn't realize that it really happened to you. I wondered about that. Um, and the second passage you read captures what's generally the tone of the novel, I think, um, observational, but there's just enough distance to, the, you, you fit a kind of understated humor just because you're observing everything so clearly. And uh, even if 
the character doesn't even understand what's happening sometimes emotionally or otherwise. So I, I just think it's an amazing feat that you pulled off. I just love it. Um, let me ask you about the, the title. I wondered about that. How did that come about? Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for all your kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, the title is actually um, from a Lucinda Williams song, uh, Metal Firecracker. Um, so I mentioned before that it's, it's sort of a love story um, and the protagonist and her partner, Chris, uh, both love Lucinda Williams and, and her music is very important to them and helps them come together. Um, so it's about that, but also the book is about surveillance and privacy and how much of ourselves is really in our digital mirror image. Um, so like in that passage I read in the opening, there's all these kind of questions that she sends out into the universe uh, via the internet. Um, so, so it's also sort of a reference to that. Yeah, that's good. I, I hadn't realized that. Um, of course, I love Listen to Williams too, and uh, share that with Stacy and her <laughs> partner's um, passion. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I thought it was a kind of, um, it's sort of an unfinished statement, you know, um, that's kind of the way I saw it as I was trying to match it to what I had just read in some sense. Yeah, and, and the book is also about uncertainty and um, sort of this moment in Newfoundland where we're experiencing this economic collapse uh, and services being pulled out from under people and so there's not a really, it's not easy to clearly visualize what the future might look like, even more so now than when I was writing the book, of course. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so I feel like that is sort of resonating in the title a little bit too, uh, maybe. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's well said. I mean, that's something obviously that struck me. It's interesting you said you started, uh, I guess, three years ago. Mm -hmm. to write this and as you say it's not like things have gotten better things have gotten more dire and what's I, I think remarkable is that this is a work about um, new adults maybe you know people in their 20s living in that environment unlike say people like me and my generation who are um, you know a relatively stable um, you know, bourgeois readers, if you will, having lived through cycles of up and down in, in the province, mm -hmm. but never really faced anything quite so dire. But a lot of people um, are facing a future um, with so much uncertainty, the kind that I think others of my generation really never, you know, there's always ambivalence in life and uncertainty, but nothing like what we're living through right now. It's sort of the, the dark side of the tourism ads, isn't it? <laughs> what you can't help but think that what you're describing here should not be given to tourists necessarily. Fair. Fair. Yeah, well, I mean, or maybe they should. Maybe it's, you know, it rounds out a picture that uh, is often presented of the province and certainly of the city as uh, somehow blithely, benignly welcoming and cheery, whereas the reality is there's a whole precarious class uh, living, and not just a younger generation, of course, it traverses generations as well. There are people who are uh, struggling um, largely because of the situation. You're writing this pre-pandemic as well. Yeah, and, and um, even though it is absolutely about that and the kind of like doom and bleakness that you can feel here. It is also about, um, you know, how committed people are to being here um, and, and kind of like the art that's happening, um, the queer community here and that like there are reasons to love life here in spite of all that. So I, I wanted to capture that too and I, I think I think that there's some joy in the book too. 
oh, there's lots of joy. I mean, again, what I said at the outset, it's that, uh, I guess it's a balance or it's just a, it's a, uh, a current or a vibe uh, that's really quite joyful despite everything. And that's because the character sees that opportunity in, in people and in relationships and friendships and love and discovery and all that. It's so true though, that what you capture there is the, um, we used to call it a subculture. It's not a subculture. It's the, it's a culture that is thriving in St. John's and, and beyond of, and I'm sure it exists in other urban places too, but it's unique to hear in the, you know, the music scene, um, the party scene, um, the fact that we, you know, surround by water and how that affects what people see in the environment and, you know, the chaos of weather, even winter, all like, like everything about that is both here and universal. Isn't it? It's just this. It's this historic moment you're capturing. Made me a bit envious uh, that I'm not young again, despite the uncertainty of job and security and economic health, uh, to be um, outside that world of young people discovering each other in a very, very vibrant social scene. Um, and I assume it's the one you lived yourself. Yeah, I mean, the book is is fiction and, and the protagonist isn't me, but I did draw on my own experiences. And um, there is, like, I started going to all ages punk shows here when I was like 12 and they would be every weekend and there would be tons of bands um, and people would have zines and, and it was an exciting community to be part of. Um, and it wasn't until I started thinking about it later that I kind of realized that every, almost everyone with this very small exception, <laughs> the people who were playing the music that we were going to see every single weekend were almost all white cis dudes. Um, and I think that's changing a bit now and people have put in a lot of work and effort to make that scene more welcoming um, to, to other types of musicians. Um, but this picture from the cover is actually my friend's band, Ye Girls, who are all women and have a punk band here. And it's really fun that we got to have this picture on the cover. I feel really happy about that. Um, but, but that's kind of an indicator of how things are beginning to change, maybe. But um, yeah. So, yeah, I guess it's not yeah. there yet. I mean, yeah. you know, to be fair, it, it would seem that to some degree the entertainment industry, so to speak. Um, and that extends into film and, um, you know, TV series or kind of stuff. Still pretty male dominated in this town as, as elsewhere. I, I'm I know less about the punk or alternative music scene, but the novel seems to capture an opening that's happening, if not a full blown metamorphosis. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the um, ease with which uh, the world that Stacy is traveling with or navigating herself through uh, lives uh, the spectrum of sexual orientation and sexual experience. It's, it's all naturalized uh, or natural, I should say. Um, and so there's no, there isn't any perception of any hostility to that, of any um, threat, sense of threat. I mean, notwithstanding the cops thing and all of that. But um, yeah, there's a kind of natural shift that has happened among Stacy's friends and Stacy and I think, yeah, I think what I was trying to capture a little bit um, is that I think for Stacy, who has the option of kind of passing as straight when, when she wants to or if she feels she needs to, um, it, is, it is a very sort of easy uh, and joyful and exciting experience to be in this first kind of serious queer relationship. But then for her partner, Chris, who's kind of a little more visibly queer, 
um, she sort of senses that there's this discomfort that maybe has come from past negativity and there's more scrutiny just when they're in public, there's these very subtle shifts that she becomes aware of. And then there is a kind of trying to negotiate what that means for it to be easy and joyful for her and to her family. You know, her family is warm and accepting of the situation, but for her partner, that has maybe not been the case. Um, so it's a little bit navigating that as well. Yeah, um, and of course, all of this is happening over a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. So the the exploration or the experience is very nuanced. There, there's a great dramatic arc of um, you know, uh, I don't know, of change and action and all of that. It's it's all subtle in the day to day mm -hmm. of one's experience of life too, which is. Uh, I imagine pretty hard to pull off. Did you have a lot of editing involved with all of that that challenged you? Yeah, I worked. I worked with my uh, editor Melanie Little, who's really great. I love her, um, and she guided me through the process, like from the very beginning. The novel was kind of a collection of scenes, and I didn't really know what order I wanted them to go in or what the sort of connective tissue would look like. Um, and she helped me think about that a lot and asked me questions um, to, to help me kind of guide that. One thing we, we played with a lot was where that opening scene with the police coming in should be um, if we wanted to give people that information from the very beginning. And ultimately I decided that I did want that because I wanted to capture how when you're kind of in this um, limbo and you don't know what's happening with an investigation which can go on and on um, and often does and uh, that just permeates your life and it's constantly present um, and nagging at you to more and more degrees, I would say, depending on the seriousness of the situation. Uh, yeah, and it's the exposure, right? The exposure mm -hmm. of everything, as you say, in that mirror material. Yeah, um, the awareness that someone is combing through your very deep private things, and you yeah. haven't had a chance to prepare for this, you know, for a group of strangers. Um, and then there's also the question of, you know, these people are police, but does that somehow preclude them from um, being, you know, creepy fucking dudes who are going through <laughs> your pictures? And uh, I would say no. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned at the outset that, um, uh, the situation was resolved or, you know, that the recognition it was a mistake happened later. Was it much later? I mean, in the book, as I say, it's only a few days, but it's haunting, mm -hmm. uh, dramatic. And in real life, how much did it, how long did it take till that was corrected? In real life, it was almost immediate. Like they okay. showed up, they didn't take my things. Um, but then I filed a complaint um, and Funnily, like three years later, the, the week that I started doing promotion of this book, I got a response to my complaint, which I then had two weeks to respond to, which I don't know if that was just an interesting coincidence or what spurred them to suddenly respond. Yeah. Um, and the complaint process was like ridiculously complicated, it revolved, involved driving all around town, navigating websites, all this kind of, you know, stuff that because I have a lot of privilege, privilege and resources at my disposal, I was able to navigate. I have a, a relative who's a lawyer who could help me with that. A lot of people don't have those options. So it is really difficult actually to lodge a complaint and really time consuming. Um, and I think that's kind of scary to think about. <laughs> Yeah, it it's certainly precludes. Yeah, gee, and as you say, that was all happening 
around the time of the Snell Grove trial and um, yeah, everything so. else. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, if I, how does it feel to be called <laughs> by others uh, as having written the defining novel of a generation? I, I'm thinking of the, you know, Lena Denham <laughs> self-described, uh, uh, you know, uh, writer of a generation tag and all that, which became really boomeranged, I guess, for her. Um, I mean, it's flattering and, and what? What else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I feel certainly very flattered by that. Um, but I don't know that that's the case or, you know, I am. Um, no, I, I, I don't know. I didn't mean to ask you. It's an embarrassing question. I guess yeah. it's my way of saying, wow, like that's, you know, that that's a great statement, great descriptor for your novel. And I have to say personally, as I said at the beginning, um, I, I found it incredibly illuminating and refreshing for opening up a whole world that I'm living among and, and didn't really see from, you know, through the eyes of, of Stacy or or the writer herself, for that matter. So, uh, are you working on the next stuff? Yeah, I'm. I am working on a new novel, um, but it's just kind of a, a collection of like images and moments of tension, and um, it's not. It doesn't have a really clear plot at this point. Yeah. Um, and I've also been teaching some online creative writing workshops, which has been really exciting um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And it's been really nice to connect with people that way in, in this time, particularly, and get to read their work. And that has been very inspiring and also just a lot of fun. Yeah, I bet. But that's stimulating for sure. Helps the writing, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll, I'll ask you one more question before we um, pause and, and go out into the world and hear what other people might want to ask of you. But, um, you know, it's a classic pattern that a writer starts with, certainly in this country, uh, with short stories and then goes to the novel. It's like short film and feature film. and. Um, you know, is, is, were you testing yourself with the highly successful barreling forward and then thought, you know what, I'm ready for a novel or it wasn't that deliberate? Um, I did want to, I wanted to try writing a novel and I wasn't sure if I would be able to do it. Um, so it felt like a challenge. And when I decided I wanted to do that, I started reading novels in a different way, I realized, like I was really attuned to the structure um, and thinking about that a lot, like how to elongate a story. Um, but also this novel began as a play that I wrote in a course with Robert Chafe. Uh, uh, so he also helped a lot. Um, the, the play was, was different, but it was dealing with a lot of the same characters and the same kind of inciting incident. Um, and I learned a lot from him and it was a really fun course. Um, and that kind of provided a skeleton of a, what it feels like to write a bigger story. Yeah, yeah. No, I, it's, it, well, I think all I ask extends quite naturally the tone and sort of um, style of barreling forward. So it seems like a natural evolution for you. Um, so again, major congratulations. Thank you so much for being part of Winterset this year. And I have a feeling you're going to be back with us <laughs> as you uh, continue to, uh, to turn stuff out and explore the world of writing and achieve great success. So thanks so much. And we'll pause now and we'll see what questions people have and, um, turn it over to you to answer them. I guess I'll let you know what they're asking. So thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much, Maureen.
we are. We're live. <laughs> and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And that was recorded, I guess, a little over a week ago. Seems ages ago. And uh, you can probably see Shannon Webb Campbell in your frame now, too. Uh, I think the best thing to do would be to take a few questions. Uh, there's a Q&A icon at the bottom or the side of your screen, depending on what you're using. And uh, Eva will take some questions and then we'll switch to the part B of this, uh, which is the recording that uh, Shannon and I did also a little over a week ago, I think. And, uh, and Eva will hang around for the questions uh, from everybody at the end of that segment. And uh, maybe the two of you will have things to say about each other's work as well. Um, I do have an initial question, and this was asked yesterday, Eva, by uh, a reader or a, uh, an observer participant of Meg, uh, Meg uh, Gail Coles. And the question is pretty straightforward. What's the best thing? that somebody has said about your work? Besides, of course, all the great things I've already said about it. Um, I think a, a couple people have written to me and said that they felt like uh, it really reflected their experience of St. John's. Um, and I found that like really rewarding and exciting to hear. Um, one person is Andrew Sampson, who has this great newsletter. Um, I, I can't think of the title now, but if you look him up on Twitter, you'll find it. And he writes about, uh, I think, literature in general, but with a focus on Canlit. Um, and he, he used to live in St. John's, and I feel really lucky he wrote about my book, but he also writes about lots of people's books, as I just said. So it's a great newsletter, and if people are interested in books, they should check it out. Yeah, I noticed he was writing you up this week, and uh, I think you did a did a little conversation with him as well. So yeah, add that to the repertoire when people are going to start to research your work and start to write essays and can lit classes about it. And about the, I know it's weird, isn't it? Is it weird watching that conversation for you? Yes, I I had to mute it because it's a bit like hearing your voice on the answering machine or something. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a strange, alienating experience, for sure. Well, you know, the technology has challenged us to think of ways of of uh, featuring all of you. So it's it's been okay. It's been an interesting exercise. I hope we never have to do it again, and I hope we can see and hear you in person next year. Um, the line, as they say, is open for any other questions. Uh, for Eva, we've got uh, lots of people paying attention, but nobody's asking any questions at the moment. So I'm thinking maybe what we'll do is uh, move on to the pre-recorded section of Shannon at this stage, and then we'll come back to the live conversation with both of you. How about that? So Mr. Technician, over to you. Welcome to Winter Set in Summer. Uh, this is a first for, I guess, all of us, those of you who are watching and listening. And for me, I'm a Winter Set, long standing Winter Set board member, Noreen Golfman. And it is my great pleasure to be introducing our first reader and artist, writer, poet for this um, auspicious experiment that we're doing, not being able because of a pandemic to meet in person on the beautiful Eastport Peninsula. Uh, Shannon Webb Campbell is no stranger to Winterset. Um, she's been with us before. She has, uh, I'm using the word roots in a loaded way because roots are a big part of, of Shannon's uh, repertoire. Um, but she certainly has roots on this island of Newfoundland. She will be reading from a beautiful collection of poems called I Am a Body of Land. 
And um, I have to say I'm excited to hear her read because I've been living in my head with these poems for some time in anticipation of this conversation we're about to have. Um, she's currently, boldly, completing a PhD in creative writing in um, St. John, New Brunswick. And uh, I think she's lived in several Atlantic spots and um, will probably be re relocating again. So there's a nomadic aspect to Shannon's life I'd love to talk about as well, because I think it informs some of the themes of her poetry as well. So without further ado, we'll hear from Shannon and then we'll pick it up and have a conversation about her work. Uh, well, Alan, Noreen, for that lovely introduction and thank you to Winterset in Summer for inviting me to be a part of your festival. I'm Shannon Webb Campbell, a member of Halapu Mi'kmaq First Nation, and I'll be reading from my poetry collection, I Am a Body of Land, that was edited by Lee Maracle. I'm going to begin with the poem, See How Low the Moon Hangs, uh, which recently was transformed into a classical music piece with Duo Concertante premiering this summer at Tuckmore Festival. See how low the moon hangs. When stars touch cliffs, land moves closer to sky, to meet Earth's breath. Return to where water outweighs land. Between feral bog and the ocean's expanse, find remedy to temper your heart's fury. Big skies heave shades of gray, winds howl their own voice. Love needs truth and witness, no hesitations, always a spare room to gather lifetimes and generations. Um, I write a lot about Newfoundland and about, about my family. Uh, so this is a poem for Mary Webb, who is my great-great-grandmother on the West Coast. I only have one photo left of Mary, no taller than wildflowers with hands tucked into a soiled apron, her hair covered. She looks into a lens with eyes that know what plants are medicines and which roots hold poisons. In still life photograph, Mary grew gardens, picked berries. She distilled the moon's shine, pickled harvests, and kept meat. Taught her youngsters to skin rabbits, make liquor blind. Never drink the old stuff, she said. Whenever I drink or my moon bleeds, I think of Mary, who traveled to women's wombs by dog team, horses, sometimes even snowshoes. Don't matter how many days it took or what storm railed down home. She took medicines with her, bleached bloody bodies. Mary always got there in time for the baby. Grandmother went to the hospital sick in 78, kept praying for young ones to grow old. Help them help those who carry on when she goes. Mary died five years and four days before I got born, yet something inside me calls for her. Their worldview is a new home in an ancient land. If you think you can hold dominion over flora and fauna, that a body and life can be property, you'd better try buying a constellation. I'm not landless nor law. In sorrow's aftermath, remind me, I am a body of land unlearning what cannot be expressed. Dig to find a physical knowing ceremony our cells remind us we are living in the intersection of trauma and desire, a disordered state. How can we imagine ourselves not broken, set vowels and variables, open to seven generations before and after? Um, to continue on my Newfoundland theme, which uh, is, is very prevalent in almost everything I write, but I certainly have a bone to pick with Joey Smallwood, and this is my poetic way of doing so. On receiving a government letter rejecting our Indian status, father calls, says they're revoking us, his voice gravel thick. A dead weight of shame returns, thousands of papers board a plane, soar through the sky to land like scalps on doorsteps of who would be Halapu. My ancestors are on trial. We no longer live in Nagoma village. Mark Smallwood's infamous words, there are no Indians on the island of Gadamcock. 
Denial repeats to eradicate Mi'kmaq existence. One too many anglicized names spins webs of displaced identity. Goddamn jacketars, government commands colonial amnesia. You do beadwork in the suburbs, Google Mi'kmaq translations, only learn to bang your drum far from home. Ottawa notes I'm not indigenous enough, still landless, no claim, no bones to home. Father says it was good for a while, but what about the next seven generations? I tell him, I am Mi'kmaq forever. Um, I'm not done with Joey. Uh, this poem is after Marilyn Dumont's letter to Sir John A. Macdonald, letter to Joseph R. Smallwood. Dear Joey, I'm still here in mixed Mi'kmaq after all these years. You're long dead, yet Confederation couldn't stop Newfoundland's ongoing colonial violence. You continued so unapologetically, telling Ottawa there are no Red Indians. Nancy April, we killed them all. And you know, Joey, after all your declarations, bowing to the settlers, we're still here. We remain Mi'kmaq despite stolen status cards. None of us landless, all of us caribou. Um, I'd like to say I have an uplifting poem, but I don't think I do. <laughs> um, maybe someday, but I will read a few more. Um, I was really hoping to get home for the powwow this summer, but this poem will have to do. The powwow at the edge of the world. I walk with father on the grounds when all the dancers are gone. I'm told by many that I must let go, forgive what I don't know. He talks of that summer at the powwow, when all our relations were dancing. How this land is somewhere he could never live. Um, stay on the powwow grounds. The silent generation. I want to be your powwow grounds, all that is worth protecting. Pay attention on your radiant gathering. Know the rhythm of your heart. Trust wherever spirit wants to go. Fill minds with voices of ancestors. Sing broken prayers for sunless skies. If anyone has arrived or mastered grace, pardon death and receive your rewards. My lament for a universal kingdom. Give rest to graciousness, make love real. Set yourself free, hide in the folds. Stretch your hand over the sea. Since we are over the sea, I will read water. Water is an ancient realm. Water intervenes and connects. Water is movement and history. Water holds and protects. Water releases and bombards. Water is ecology and future. Water traumatizes and witnesses. Water silences. Water resolves. Water is absent and violent. Water survives. Water is wound and healer. Water speaks. Waliok water protectors. Walalan. We are made of oceans. We are made of inaudible waterways. We are volatile undercurrents. We are upstream. We are replenishing downstream. We are rushing rivers. We are winding waterfalls. We are overflowing lakes. We are wayward waterways. We are wild swimmers. We are liquid ceremony. We are sky. We are vapor. We are unnameable fluidity. We are pollution in the sea. We are languages of saliva. We are bodies of water. And I'd like to just read two more. Um, I will read a new poem, uh, which is coming out in my forthcoming collection in 2021, Lunar Tides with Book Hug. Uh, it's called Ecology of Being, which also became the title of Duo Concertante's um, performance pieces. Ecology of Being. In this thinner air atmosphere, there is no need to ingest crystals. We are surrounded by the boreal forest at the breakdown of natural order. We exist as intervention between land and sky, only to return from a journey to a place of familiarization. Forgo the crazy power of selfhood. Pain is singular. It triggers memorable experiences if you embody new occult poetics. Between the self and this other thing, we make a clearing to find meaning. 
travel to trembling aspens and find medicines. Remember this leaf makes ecological connections, experiences seasons at their breaking point, and reinvents our skin cells. And I'll finish with uh, a love poem, which I think is a nice way to end, certainly what Lee Miracle has taught me to end with. If love is our last hope, the medicine wheel is our compass. Look north to catch midnight, find death in winter. Look east for dawn, find light in spring. Look south at birth, find rebirth in summer. Look west at dusk, find wisdom in fall. Each direction, a spirit helper, an element, a sacred medicine. A circle embodies the passage of sun and four seasons. I am of the dawn here at the edge, knowing first light. You no longer shades of day. Look to animal stars, find sweet grass. Look for mineral sun, find tobacco. Look at plant moon, find cedar. Look to human earth, find sage. Our lives move in circles. We are sunwise. Well, Ellen, for listening. Well, thank you, Shannon. That was beautiful. And as I said, I was keen to hear you, your voice, express those poems that I've been living with for quite some time. I feel quite familiar with them, but it's always different hearing the poet read. Uh, you said at the outset that um, your editor was Lee Maracle. That's a kind of um, famous element to this publication and to this collection. Lee Maracle, of course, an icon, pioneer of Indigenous writing in this country. I remember even as an undergraduate studying Canadian literature, Lee's work started to emerge and it was um, challenging and um, powerful. And so it's, it's lovely to think about the collaboration that you had that ended up producing this particular work. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that collaboration? Let me uh, perhaps tee you off by saying that, or commenting on something Lee has said, that mm -hmm. this is not, I think she said this in a number of places, not a traditional book. I think you've said the same thing. Of course, it has you know a cover and paper and mm -hmm. words on text, uh, maybe you can say something about um, what you and Lee mean by that. Okay. I mean, Lee, uh, Lee is a force and an, an incredible editor and human being and thinker. Um, and the, the book isn't a typical book because it didn't follow a, a standard literary process. Um, you know, the book, it was originally published as Who Took My Sister, and we quickly learned, uh, my publisher and I, that we had breached Indigenous protocol and made a huge mistake. And so I was met with Lee um, shortly after a phone call. Uh, she said, I hear you're in trouble. I said, I am in trouble. And um, our process kind of unfolded from there. So we had some phone calls. And then she said, why don't you just come over to my porch in Toronto? And uh, I was living in Montreal at the time. So I went to Toronto and we spent the afternoon going through the entire text and going line by line, poem by poem. And the, in, the process is not a typical process, I think, for a poet to go through, but a, a transformative one. Yeah, I guess the um, the appearance of the book, the material itself, mm -hmm. is like any other material object. But as you say, it's the process that led to this collection that marks it as quite different. A collaboration of much, much more potent, I think, sense of that term. Um, perhaps listeners aren't aware of what led to, um, let's say, the difficult place you were in. Maybe you could just say a few words about that to make that clear. Um, it, was, it was a book that I had put out in March 2018 called Who Took My Sister, which had, had appeared, many of the poems had appeared in different anthologies and collections, um, but we weren't uh, aware that it was 
breaching indigenous protocol by not speaking to the families that were mentioned in the book. And um, so we quickly pulled that because we certainly did not want to create any more harm to anyone. And the book became something very different. And the teachings from Lee uh, sit with me in my everyday life. I think about her all the time and I think about what my position is as a mixed Indigenous person, a very white passing woman, a very privileged woman, um, and what my role as a poet is and what my attempt was versus what my reality is. And I think I'm a body of land is more true to my experience, um, my personal poetics and my personal experiences and family and questions, right? I mean, I have many questions uh, in the text and outside of the text. Yeah, I, I think those questions are for the reader too. It is, as a lot of poetry is both so personal and intimate, so much about your experience on the one hand, but an invitation to the reader, I certainly felt that way, to be exploring the same kinds of questions. And I would be on the, of course, white settler side of the ledger in terms of reading, as probably many people who are tuned in right now would be. But um, the questions you raise have to do so much with that fluidity or uncertainty of identity. and who owns identity and one obvious, uh, maybe obvious after I've lived with the poems long enough, maybe not so obvious at first, but one obvious theme or um, thread through the collection is that inhabiting of an in-between space. Um, on the one hand, nature is so important and so potent as an instructor Mm -hmm. uh, for everything, um, the land, earth, water, the ground. But on the other, the human who's traversing all of that uh, is doing so both respectfully, but always in the state of ambivalence or often in the state of ambivalence about who you are and where you are. And of course, it has so much to do with your indigenous cultural questioning uh, and its relation to the settler culture. But it's, it would be the same for any reader, don't you mm -hmm. think, uh, in 2020, asking those questions, particularly for readers who are interested in the settler relation to Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the walking between worlds or seeing two ways, like I think of what uh, Elder Albert uh, spoke about, two-eyed seeing, and I, and I look at the, the text now and I can really see both views. Like I see the settler language and point of view and then I see the indigenous connection. And I think even if you're not indigenous, I think we're living in 2020 and we're acknowledging the land where we are and the territories and the people and who made this turtle island. And I think there's, there's a, we're all kind of a little bit of both, at least that's what maybe I'm quoting the there. Yeah. We're, we're, we have both views. Yeah, I, I, I think that's reassuring for, for everybody um, who's attentive or sensitive to the importance of recognition mm -hmm. and reconciliation for that matter. Um, it's that um, not, not being one thing or the other, not being absolute settler or absolute indigenous. I, I think that's a really important and in some ways uh, illuminating and, and new idea. Uh, we're so used to be thinking in essentialist terms about who we are, but in the, again, the kind of fluid, mobile, um, and in often is the case, hidden cultural realities, hidden to mm -hmm. us. Um, raising those questions is really important or embracing that ambivalence or uncertainty seems to me really important. If you're comfortable with living with that kind of ambivalence, a lot of people are poets tend to be. I think poets are curious. I yeah. think we, we walk in a different path than most. Yeah, that, that's probably true. I, I, I think I've read that you said somewhere else in an interview 
that you found poetry dangerous and that's why you were attracted to it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was as dangerous as probably when I claimed it at the time, but um, you know, poetry is very political and it is a record of time and ideas and questions. But I, I am always intrigued by poetry's possibility. And, I, and I'm quite surprised constantly in my life where poetry leads me. Um, and it's something, you know, maybe at a certain point I thought, oh, I might give this up, you know, <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're dancing on that edge there all the time. Uh, in fact, that's something I think Lee Americal says at the outset about trying to, I think I have a quotation here, it really popped out at me. Make sure we are not dancing on the edge of a stereotype. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that was equally important to you and her as you were creating the images that would go down, as you say, on the record. On the record, the one that would stay. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, colonialism, I come from a very Western education. I've gone through academia. I'm still in it. And that certainly influenced my thinking and my writing. And um, I really describe a lot of my writing now as kind of undoing or unlearning something uh, as opposed to learning. Yeah, and um, that's very much part of the national project, I think, in the academy itself, mm -hmm. which in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is, is really an imperative to be undoing mm -hmm. uh, what what we've taken for granted and, and make, make it new. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, you were, you're talking about the words, your poems being part of the record. And I had the sense very much of you being in a process on a journey in this collection. The poems are, I know they, they've been published in other pieces and at different times, but a collection is, is just that, isn't it? You have to shape and frame the poems in a way that takes the reader through something. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a kind of tension there between the static nature of the words on the page and the journey you're taking that reader, which is your own journey, I guess, from a place of, to use your word, shame mm -hmm. at the outset um, to, um, I don't know what nouns are appropriate. Is, is it acceptance, celebration? Uh, maybe you can fill in those blanks. Yeah, I mean, the word maybe resilience. I think, I think of the collection, um, the through line of the book is it begins in fear and shame and this feeling of unbelonging, of outcast. Um, which then works through some of the questions of why that's that's the state the speaker uh, of the poem the poems finds themselves in but i think the the movement towards love and acceptance and even the unknowing the ability to make an error uh to to be to stand up in it is been a powerful act for the poems and the collection itself um, not only me as the writer of it, but I think there's something in exposing the vulnerability of not knowing, which I think a lot of people are in. Yeah, yeah that, that's very true. And I, I mean, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable, but I, I think it's incredibly brave of you to have exposed your vulnerability in that way and acknowledge your your shame which everybody shares in one way or the other just that we don't necessarily write a, a whole set of poems about it <laughs> we usually try and uh, repress it or cope with it differently but you sort of work through I mean is the writing itself I think I know the answer to this but is the writing itself a kind of self-care or therapy for you to get to work through the shame? Um, I mean, I'm hesitant to say that writing is therapy because writing might send you to therapy too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure that, that it's like always the safe cradle 
Um, but it through most of my writing, and even even when I try to write academically, I always write from the self or the state that I'm in, because it's it's a way probably to acknowledge to myself what I'm thinking or feeling. Uh, or questioning and and I don't know if that's been like my mission but it's what I've done right and, and I have a hard time veering from I can hear my mother being like do you need to put that down in a poem like really like most of us think it and then put it somewhere else they're like no it's got to go in the poem <laughs> someone else might feel that way right like I, I guess I'm acknowledging that like my suffering isn't so unique is it I yeah. know yeah, no, I, 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 I hear you on that. And I'm always a little reluctant to talk about writing as therapy as well. But since this is so much about an experience of um, coping with or reconciling yourself to your vulnerability over something mm -hmm. that happened, um, it's hard to separate uh, the body of the text from the body that is you, I guess, which points to the title. Yeah, for sure. That definitely speaks like the, the I'm a body, like I, I am a body of land, but so is the text, right? Yeah. The ideas in there. And, um, you know, I think as writers, we inhabit what we're, we're saying, writing, thinking, being. Our spirit wants to say something. Uh, and sometimes the body or the brain is slower than what you think is on the page. I think that's part of what I've also learned with Lee was, she was like, what are you actually trying to say? And I'm yeah. like, I'm not always sure. Like I'm figuring it out as I write. And, and I think part of poetry or the poetics is you can hide a lot in there, but I, I'm not, so I'm not hiding much in there. Uh, I'm saying it just so it can not live in my body and be a, a source of shame. Yeah. And, um, Sharing, I mean, once you commit it to words that way, you're sharing it. Um, I guess there is um, some relief maybe in doing that, a kind of scary at mm -hmm. once, but relief in letting others see that vulnerability in you. But maybe it relieves you of the burden of it too. Yeah, I mean, when I think back to when I put out my first book, my first collection, Still No Word, I had such fear. I lost my voice for five days. Yeah, I bet. Like, so afraid. So, I mean, the second collection, it didn't go very well in the beginning. And then I had to, like, it's, there's there's been a process in owning my voice. And I think poetry has led me to that. But it was very scary, like, especially when I think back to the beginning. Um I only feel like I'm learning to speak a little now. With the, yeah, well, the, poem, at least the poems speak very well for you. So, um, yeah, as I said, I, I think it's, it's all guts, really, to put yourself out there like that. Far gutsier than writing academic work. I say that <laughs> with intimate knowledge of that whole uh, uh, exercise or activity that we're all, if you you know, go through graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, train to do. Um, it's quite different. In fact, sometimes that's a way of suppressing or repressing voice. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, you know, so I think objectifying yeah. knowledge by burying yourself. I, so please don't, don't take that route. <laughs> yeah. no, I, mean, I can't. <laughs> I try and they're like, this is such a personal essay. I'm like, I thought this was an academic essay. <laughs> Yeah. I'm really, I don't, I don't even think I have it in me. Like, I think I can write, you know, write a different kind of essay, but um, it's, I, I think my sense of self has to come out in there. I'm not sure. Maybe that's a narcissistic thing. But. No, I, I don't think so. I think with the emergence, certainly in my own formation of feminism uh, into literary theory and into the academy, there was a kind of opening up of the space that uh, had been inhabited by uh, that so-called authoritative voice of, you know, critical observation. Mm -hmm. I think that's true in humanities as much for the social sciences, a kind of the adopting the voice of the science or pseudoscience observer. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was starting to get challenged and those borders started to um, become more porous 
I think, between academic and non, so-called non-academic writing. And I think now with the emergence of new voices in the country, the diversity of immigrant voices, Black voices, Indigenous voices, um, it's the old adage, you know, of the personal being political. Mm -hmm. um, the personal has a lot to say about knowledge and reality and experience. So, um, no, no, don't, uh, don't find, don't, my, my imperative to you would be, you know, resist, don't go back to that mid 20th century and earlier notion of what, of how truth can be expressed. Mm -hmm. No, no worries there. Yeah. <laughs> you're just, you're just stoking the fire. You're uh, on the right path. <laughs> excellent. That's great. Um, I'm wondering, you were reading from some new stuff, and I'm wondering where this journey is taking you through your poetry. Um, you know, you're really laid on the table, I think, in this collection, um, some of the big, the big questions that, as we said earlier, we're all dealing with in terms of identity and place and belonging, the right to belong, the right to claim belonging. Uh, we're all kind of mired in those questions right now, aren't we? It's a minefield. It's mm -hmm. a minefield. Yeah. Um, so where do you see your voice going? Um, if you want to talk about it, or maybe you're still too mired in the process to, to reveal that. No, I can speak about it. I mean, I think of the word belonging, um, just to touch on what you just said, because I think that's what... Uh, both uh, still no word and I'm a body of land were very much about the desire to belong or to know I belong or um, to write myself into belonging and and I don't feel that's my big question uh, anymore um, I feel like you know I know where I belong I know who I belong to um, but I, I have seen like going forward with my work it's a lot about grief uh, and loss I recently lost my mother in the fall oh. um, yeah, which is very difficult. Um, yeah. but the text that I'm working on, Lunar Tides, is kind of the relationship to the tides and the moon and mothers and, uh, and what it means to not be a mother at this stage of my life. Like a lot of questions around um, not belonging, because I know I belong, uh, but what happens when who you belong to is in a different place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, your father figures quite prominently in your work. Um, yeah. Your mother less so, but mothers are <laughs> mothers are who we are, right? So um, I'm sure her uh, her absence doesn't mean she's absent from you. And um, so good luck with that wrestling with with that grief and that experience. That's always changing. Having lost my mother some time ago, and that continues to be a work of memory and um, uh, consideration of what that relationship was and can even continues to be long after. Mm. Yeah, we all come from a mother, right? It's the, it's the next big question, um, you know. Right, I wrote about my father a lot. Uh, my mom didn't want to be written about, and it's not so much that I feel like, oh, she's gone, and I can definitely be like, oh, I know you don't like this, so I'm going to change that line. Um, but writing to her, towards her, or what that means, uh, to me, feels like my way of moving forward. Right. Well, we're keen to read, see, and hear what that's all going to look like. Uh, we're going to turn this to questions, I think, shortly. And um, before I do that, I just want to comment on the beautiful composition of your, of your frame <laughs> presence. And I have to say, none of that surprises me because I follow you on social media and your posts are pretty exclusively about beauty. Mm. Um, they are some of the most beautiful posts in my bubble of people I follow and people who follow me. So you're, you're very attentive to framing and shaping and um, 
I, I, it seems to me, seeking beauty in, in, the, in the ordinary, in um, both the natural world and the domestic world, which you are embodying perfectly right now. <laughs> well, thanks for giving me, and I'm sure countless others, pleasure from your posts. They're really, really always lovely to, okay. to look at. Yeah, I hope people have sent that to you before, but it's a conspicuous feature of your social media presence. <laughs> in a cesspool of, you know, hateful text. There's a Campbell image of beauty. So I think we, the world needs more beauty. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. It's in danger of disappearing. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate that, Noreen. That's really sweet. Yeah, no, I was looking forward to sharing that with you because uh, I always think of that. Wow. So thank you. Keep doing that. I will. <laughs> So I think uh, we'll um, turn it over to, I'm going to see what has popped up in terms of um, any listeners and watchers out there might have something to toss to you. Okay, so we're back. And uh, thanks everybody for hanging in. There's a whole bunch of people, lots of questions. And I don't know that we'll have time to go through all of them. Um, you know, it's a sunny afternoon here on the island. We're all speaking from different parts of the island. I think we're all near water somewhere. Um, but um, it's, uh, it's a commitment on a Sunday afternoon for a lot of people. And, uh, but lots of, qu lots of questions, lots of curiosity. Um, Shannon, since we just concluded our conversation or the... Uh, rolling out of it, um, there's a question that's, um, that's really interesting. Today is World International Indigenous People's Day, or World Indigenous People's Day, I should say. I guess international is redundant. Um, so somebody wants to know, does that have any meaning for Indigenous peoples? Or does that have any meaning, dot, 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 question mark? Um, I mean, I couldn't speak for anybody but myself, but I think it's like any day, um, a little recognition, a nod. Um, I'm actually speaking to you guys from Belle Island and I was thinking of my grandmother uh, who's buried here and, and she didn't really believe there were indigenous people in Newfoundland and in listening to the poems and being in Belle Island and thinking she got it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there is, I think there is some meaning behind that day. Yeah, well, good. Well, Joey, of course, said there were no Indians at the time of our entering Confederation. So, mm -hmm. yeah, what the hell did he know, right? How much? <laughs> not much. No, well, some things, but not everything for sure. Uh, a question for both of you uh, about the writing process. You know, writing is hard, um, even though you're both writers. Um, question about, you know, how do you kickstart yourself or... I'm wondering whether your process, if you can call it that, is uh, even knowable, or how does that happen? How do you get the stuff out? Eva, I'll start with you. I keep a journal where I'm always writing about um, my day and things that I have, little scenes that I've seen playing out while I'm out in the world, um, or, or very personal experiences as well, and how often from um, I maybe fictionalize it, but um, so I often begin there with something that I my Yeah, we're having some sound issues, I think. Uh, yeah. you? Not quite sure why. Uh, we can hear you, but there seems to be some interference. At least that's, you know, just we're in live, uh, live stream here, so things happen. Sounds like there's a vacuum cleaner going. <laughs> Oh, no. Maybe yeah. somebody's mowing a lawn. Uh, I will, I'll just go to Shannon now and we'll... Um, do I, I don't always know what I'm writing, for sure. I think I was interested to hear that Eva had um, written the play first before writing All I Ask as a novel, because I also took the same course with Robert and 
and I think I dabble in different kinds of writing because I just hear like fragments or I might have a story, but I never have anything fully formed. Um, and it, it is like journaling. Uh, it might be moments like letters for a long time were a way that was like an entry point for me to get started. Um, but yeah, I was interested to hear that Eva started with, with the um, play. Yeah, and of course, Robert's such a huge info. Robert Chafe, award Governor General's Award winning playwright, a uh, huge influence on the writing culture of this province, uh, for sure. And you're both evidence of that and a great teacher, mentor. Sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a question for each of you um, that's related to the genres you're working in. Uh, for Eva, you mentioned working on structure and you were talking about sort of dealing with how to write a novel, how it's different from a short story. And the question is, it sounds like you had a number of events or scenes which then needed to be put into a timeline. Is that, is that somebody wants to know, is that what you were saying? And how do you go about choosing uh, where things go in that timeline? Um, well, as we were just talking about, I, I worked with Robert Chafe on the, on the story as a play originally. That was a bit different, but he encouraged me to write all the scenes out on like flashcards and literally lay them out on the floor and move them around and see um, how they worked uh, because I'm, I wasn't writing the story totally linearly. Um, and then I also worked with my editor, Melanie Little, who, who we were doing the same thing, but in a less kind of like literal physical way. But it's uh, a thing I've been thinking about a lot in teaching the um, creative writing workshops I've been doing. And we talk about, is it easier to hear me now or no? Yeah, it's great. Okay. Talk about um, like theme and structure. And I came across this Chekhov quote where he says something I, I won't remember it exactly but the idea is that the job of art is not to provide answers but to articulate questions um, and I think when I'm thinking about structure I'm trying to articulate a question and it doesn't necessarily mean that the action is going to tie up um, neatly but that that question has been posed yeah that's interesting um, a whole other challenge, I guess, for writing uh, prose in that, or scenes in, in uh, moments in time when you're thinking about it that way. Um, Shannon, here's a question also about the writing process or uh, the material part of it. A few of your poems are organized differently on the page. So it often happens with poetry where the, you know, the canvas of that space uh, is played with, right? And so what's the idea behind that for different poems? How you organize the space of the page and the words on the page are scattered differently? Um, I mean, each poem, I think it needs to find it's like visual spot on the page. There's mm. something playing, sometimes I find it's a playful act with the reader. You have to make a, a, and then a line will read differently if you, you know, put it, a line here and then a line here um, to break it up. And, but I often find it's like toying with the poem for myself and then for the reader and um, kind of taking up space, like actually taking up physical space on the page. Cause sometimes my poems are really short and I think, well, what if, what if I made you bigger? What if you took up two pages and, and give the reader time to digest what the line is? Yeah, good. A uh, question for both of you about this particular moment. Here we are, August 10th, 2020, is uh, as you're working through new material, um, even in your head, um, are you aware of or conscious or self-conscious about how the pandemic might be influencing what you're working on now? I guess it's hard not to, but in any really obvious ways that you can talk about? Eva, any, any thoughts about that? Um, 
Yeah, I have been thinking about it and writing about it um, just in the kind of notes and beginnings of the project that I'm working on now. Um, and I imagine that, you know, there will be long lasting changes to the world um, caused by the pandemic. And uh, so I, I feel like if I'm, my writing is usually about it's realism uh, about the present. So I feel like, yes, I will be writing about it and the, and the after effects of it. Yeah. Yeah. And Janet? Um, I'm not writing about the pandemic, but I think it's because I'm like overwhelmed with grief already. Um, and writing my way through the loss of my mother feels bigger than the pandemic for me because it's personally affected my life in such a way. But I, I mean, the pandemic might come in there, but at this point, the greater loss for me is, was my mom. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody wants to know, and you, you said in our conversation that your poems were not really very uplifting, although I would argue that they are. It's, <laughs> many of them, especially as you work through to a place of confidence and more certainty in, in your collection. But somebody's curious about um, your community. Do you think there is hopeful, hopeful work brewing in you? You're, you're working through grief, obviously. Doesn't mean it's without hope, though. Um, is that something you think about, you know, being deliberately hopeful or not, or? Um, I mean, I think it goes a little bit with the thread of always seeking beauty. I think I am mm. seeking hope, right? And I'm uh, always looking to just find some kind of silver lining in, in a moment. Uh, and I think that's a big part of my poetic practice because as much as I could say they're depressing, a lot of the poems have a lot of love and, um, and I wouldn't say joy yet, but like they're, there is a like an a, like a sparkle, or there's something to them that um, alludes to the the fact that I think that um, there, there there's love, right? There's love in everything we do, and certainly a writer loves their work and what they're writing about, regardless of the vantage point or the trauma or the reality. I think everything is sort of done with love. Yeah, and Eva, do you think about that? Are you self-conscious about that? And do you think about your readers that way or shag it? You're just writing what you need to write. Oh, can't hear you. We've lost your sound. I think I had it muted. That's all right. Um, I guess not in the writing process or certainly not in the beginning stages. Maybe I would go back and, and think about that. I, I, I don't think I feel like writing has to have hope or joy necessarily. And, you know. Yeah. No, it doesn't have to have any of that. For me. It has to be true to you, no doubt. That's what it has to have. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. And I'm just wondering, as a kind of last question to both of you, is there anything you would like readers to know that you didn't say in your conversation or listening to yourself again you're thinking oh, i wish i hadn't said that i really meant that or this is your opportunity to to do that maybe maybe that's not the case at all eva any any final thoughts for readers um, and listeners i think i would just like to say thank you to you Noreen and and to you as well Shannon that was such a great reading and um I I really enjoyed getting to listen to your conversation as well um and thank you to everyone for being here virtually <laughs> yes. Shannon any last thoughts uh, I mean I would echo the same thing it's been such a pleasure I'm such a huge fan of Eva's work so it's really a delight to listen and sort of be together and Noreen thanks so much for your wonderful host being and to everyone out there it's so nice to to sort of be together mm -hmm. yeah well it's been a real privilege for me for sure to have spent all this this time with you both and um, we wish you 
all the success and good health and joy uh, as the months to come. And we hope we see you in person at Winter Set soon. And uh, as um, I think our intro mentions, next year is our 20th anniversary. So we're scheming all kinds of celebratory possibilities. So stay tuned. I'm sure we'll be in touch with you. And good luck with the writing, of course, and everything else. Thanks so much for giving of your, your time and, uh, and of yourselves to Winterset. And thanks to everybody else for sticking with us through all of these sessions or recordings, really been a pleasure. And um, sometimes a trying exercise behind the scenes, but we think the results have been well worth it. So thanks everybody. See you in 2020 and happy reading. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>